Okay, so now we're ready for belief number four about fractions. Now recall, a fraction is an answer to a division problem, and I'm thinking of division as sharing in my model. In fact, the fraction a over b is actually the amount of pi each student receives if a pies are shared equally among b students. For example, six pies shared equally among three students will actually result in two pies per student. Grand. Great. Let me ask this. Suppose I were to double the number of pies and also double the number of students. So instead of having six pies, I made it another six to 12 pies. So three students, another three to six students. How much pi per student is that? Well, actually, you can look at this and say, well, really, nothing's changed. It was two pies per student here. It's also two pies per student there. It's still two pies per student. Nothing's changed. If I double the number of pies and I double the number of students, that fraction's still two pies per student. It's the same quantity. Or if I triple the number of pies, there's another set of pies, I'm going to make it up to 18 pies now, and triple the number of students, I'm going to make it 9 students. Well, actually, I can still see nothing's changed. In the end, it's still going to be 2 students, 2 pies per student. So it's the same as tripling the number of pies, tripling the number of students, nothing changes. So that is my fourth fundamental belief about fractions, that if I take a general fraction, A pies, for B students, if I decide to double the number of pies and double the number of students, nothing changes. The same result I had before. Or if I chose instead to triple the number of pies and triple the number of students, nothing changes. It would be the same result I had before. Then no matter how I want to scale it, five times the number of pies and five times the number of students, nothing changes. It's still the same result as before. I can see that in this model. It's beautiful. That is my fourth fraction belief. In fact, it's the key one, it's the big one that really makes everything, actually truly everything works. It's the, it's the most important belief of all. Belief number four, let me run it properly. Belief number four is this. If I've got A pies for B students, and I scale the number of pies up by some factor K, and scale the number of students also by the same factor K, then the result is nothing's changed. You have the same answer you had before. And we like to believe this is true no matter which counting numbers A, B, and K we happen to be talking about. Okay, so let's look at this. So for example, let's say if I had three pies for five students, the fraction three-fifths, if I decide to double the number of pies and double the number of students, Nothing's changing. This is the same result. Six tenths actually the same, going to be the same result as three fifths. They're the same fraction. Or if I triple the number of pies and triple the number of students, again, nothing changes. This must be the same fraction. Or if I actually multiply the number of pies by 10 and the number of students by 10, again, we like to believe nothing changes. It's going to be the same final result. It must be the same fraction. Whoa. In fact, people tend to go backwards. Rather than scanning up and down, they start with the answer first and say, Please make this fraction look simpler. Like what? Like this fraction. 20 30 tooths. 20 30 seconds. 20 pies for 32 students. That will give some fractional amount of pi to each student. But people often say, please make that fraction look simpler. And you stare at that for a while and say, hmm, okay, all right, what can I do? And it might dawn on you, oh, I can think of 20 as 4 times 5, and I can think of 32 as 4 times 8. In which case, oh, I can apply belief number four, see the fours cancel. People often say they just cancel. I'm going to be left with five eighths. So apparently sharing 20 pies amongst 32 students is absolutely the same as sharing five pies for eight students. And that, I do admit, looks simpler. Now watch out. Some people often say reduce the fraction. Reduce the fraction. You've got to be careful with that word because in everyday language, reduce means make smaller. We haven't actually made anything smaller here. This is equal. Everything's still the same size. But what's been made smaller is the top number's been made smaller, the bottom number's been made smaller, but actual, the actual fraction has not been made smaller at all. So people say, please reduce the fraction. What they really mean is reduce the top and bottom numbers, make them look smaller, even though the fraction itself is exactly the same size. Great, fabulous. This is the power of belief number four. Okay, I've just listed our four beliefs so far. A couple of basic beliefs, a belief about multiplication to double the amount of pi per person, just double the number of pies, for example, and the belief we've just come through now. If you double the number of pies and double the number of students this time, then actually you really technically have changed nothing. You'll get the same fraction. But let me point something out. Let's take this example. One pi for one student. That one's so simple, it's kind of a little hard to think your way through. But here's one pi for one student. One student, one pi. The question is, how much pi per student is that? Well, I guess it's, well, one pi. Bingo. So people think this is straightforward. One pi for one student is obviously just one pi per student. Great. 
But if you've got that in your head, then I claim you don't actually need beliefs one and beliefs two to be listed on the board. Because technically, I'm a mathematician, I can tell you they logically follow from these beliefs. Let me show you how. If you, if you like the pure theoretical stuff, this moment is for you. Let me show how this belief, belief number two, is actually a logical consequence of this belief. If you're willing to believe that one over one equals one, which most people do. All right, here goes. I'll take uh, uh, belief number two. That's about A pies for A students. All right. Okay, I want to work through that and see if I can deduce that really does have to have the value one. All right, let's see. Well, the clever thing is to think of, well, by order arithmetic, a is a times 1. That's still a. A is also a times 1. That's still a. So let's rewrite it that way. The top number is a times 1, and the bottom number is a times 1. Oh, but now I see a common factor. In fact, belief number 4 says if you see a common factor, you can pretend it's not there. Get rid of it. So this is really the same as 1 1, according to belief number 4, which we just said equals 1 which is what belief number two wanted. So actually, I could argue belief number two technically does not need to be listed on the board. It actually follows as a consequence of belief number four. I'm going to leave it there because most people don't like the theory, but that's okay. But if theory is your thing, then I have a challenge for you. Can you show that belief number one is actually a logical consequence of those two and technically does not need to be listed on the board if you believe that one one is one? Give it a try if you like, or just move on to the next video.